Hi, it's Katrina. God Icon All over the world, there is a religious god icon that can be found at dozens and dozens of ruins. This icon looks basically identical from Egypt to South America, from the Celts to the ancient Greeks, from the Persians to the Assyrians, and many more. The icon is always found in the center of doorways and archways, usually etched in stone at the peak of temple doors. The icon can either be male or female, and sometimes it even looks like a monster, but there is no mistaking how similar they all are, with the way that their arms are outstretched and the fact that they are always in the exact same position, holding something in their hands. But what could this all mean? We know it has something to do with religion and that it has to do with perfect symmetry. Each religious icon has arms outstretched in opposite directions, and they are always holding twin objects, being perfectly symmetrical. Richard Tassaro has gone in depth in the subject and proposes that the world's first culture shared the same religious icon, and that it is the symbol of a forgotten Golden Age religion that was shared around the world. The discovery of all these icons suggests that the ancient cultures of our world were more familiar with each other than we give them credit for. How is it possible for cultures that have never met to have the same religious icon and carve it in the same sacred places above entrances of religious or spiritual places? Of course, we have no idea how ancient cultures could have been in contact with one another or how they became inspired to create the same things. But the theory is that as humans evolved and religion began, those early people continued the same tradition as they spread and migrated throughout the world. What do you think could explain these similarities? Let me know in the comments below. Stone circles Stone circles have been found all over the world, and while Stonehenge in England is definitely the most well-known Neolithic site, it is only one of many. Just in the UK, there are many other standing stones, such as the Kalanish Stones in Scotland that are believed to be around 5,000 years old and constructed by a society of unknown people. Then there is the Drombeg Stone Circle in Ireland, which is around 3,000 years old and may have been used for ritual sacrifices. In France, there is an army of around 3,000 megalithic standing stones in Brittany, all of which date back to around 4,500 BC. That's about 7,000 years ago. In South Korea, there is the Go Chang Dolmen site, which consists of huge stone structures much like the ones at Stonehenge, only there are thousands of them constructed across the landscape and still standing today. And don't forget the deer stones found scattered across Siberia and Mongolia. There are about 1,200 of these standing stones that were erected around 3,000 years ago and stand roughly 13 feet tall. Then you have those in Spain, Denmark, Morocco, the list goes on and on. The coincidence here is, of course, that ancient civilizations from every corner of the globe constructed eerily similar stone circles, most of which were used for sacrifice, for tracking the stars, and for other things that we are still trying to uncover. Edgar Allan Poe, Future Teller Edgar Allan Poe published a story of a shipwreck in 1839. It was called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, and it was the only complete novel ever written by the famous poet. In the book, the narrator describes a horrifying tale of disaster on the high seas. The main character is a stowaway on his father's whaling ship. There's a mutiny, a large storm, and the main character becomes stuck below deck with a friend and two others, Dirk Peters and Richard Parker. After suffering from hunger and eating nothing but a bit of old turtle meat, they realize it's time to sacrifice one of the group for the sake of the rest. It ends up being Richard Parker who's sacrificed to be eaten by the few remaining crew members. After the book was published, it was a complete failure. Critics hated it because it was too violent and too inaccurate. Poe himself had to come out and agree that it was a very silly book. It wasn't until much later that it became a cult classic. Jules Verne even published a sequel in 1897. But here's the terrifying coincidence. In 1884, a yacht left England en route to Australia. It was called the Mignonette, and it wasn't prepared to make such a huge trip. It sank in a storm, four men escaped in a lifeboat, and they survived by eating turtle meat. This was very similar to Poe's story. Another similar aspect is that on the ship was a man named Richard Parker, the same name of the guy who gets eaten in Poe's novel. He was ultimately killed and eaten by the others in the lifeboat, who even cut him open and drank his blood while it was still fresh and warm. As you can see, the coincidence here is remarkable. Either Poe could see into the future, or his imagination was so powerful that his story actually came true in real life. Worship of the Sun All over the world, people have worshipped the sun. 
It's one of the defining features of ancient societies. Evidence of sun worship has been found in Egypt, Peru, Europe, and almost every major and minor civilization since the dawn of time. According to Britannica, we have proof that the veneration of the sun or a manifestation of the sun has been worshipped as early as the 14th century BC. That's 16,000 years ago. Today, worshipping the sun is seen as a pagan religion. However, every single culture has used solar motifs at some point. Even if a religion didn't specifically worship the sun, they still use solar depictions almost everywhere. So what is this coincidence all about? Why has everyone been obsessed with the sun over the past several thousand years? And why does it seem as if every major religion, even today, is just a recycled story of the sun as it rises and falls? It's because the sun is the dominant thing in everybody's life. It's what gives life, so it makes sense that every civilization would honor it in their own way. The sun gives life and light, and if it ever decided to leave, as the ancients were worried it might, everything would die. The sun can be interpreted as the great eye that watches everything you do, and as humans began to mature and build societies, the sun was the one constant. It was only natural for people to make stories about it, from the Egyptian sun god Ra to the sun heroes and sun kings of Indian mythology. Wherever the sun shone, worship followed. Vikings in South America We know today that the Vikings made it to North America before any other Europeans. They traveled to Greenland where they set up settlements and lived for decades. They also made it to the tip of northeastern Canada to the island of Newfoundland. Here, they set up the first permanent European settlement, known today as Lansau Meadows. They never spread through the rest of Canada, but they did make it here first. And, as if by coincidence, some experts say the Vikings even made it to South America before any other Europeans. The best evidence comes in the form of dog bones. French scientists Madeleine Friand and H. Reichlin investigated dogs that were mummified sometime before the Spanish conquest of South America. They were shocked to see that the dogs hadn't actually come from America, but rather from Denmark. They weren't descendants of wild Amazonian dogs, they were descendants of Danish sheepdogs. The suggestion here is that the Vikings arrived with their dogs a long time ago, then left some behind before they vanished. And here's another striking coincidence. At the archaeological site of San Agustin in Colombia, researchers found Viking ruins carved on stone statues. Then again in Peru, ruins were found on urns crafted by the Nazca people. These ruins are identical to what the Vikings used at home, meaning they had likely stopped by in South America and interacted with the locals. Where they went after or how they even got there is a huge mystery. Ancient Tongues the tongue is a very weird organ. In ancient Tibet, monks would stick their tongues out as a kind of greeting. It revealed to other people that you were good and that you weren't a demon with a secret black tongue. For cultures like the Maya and the Aztec, sticking out your tongue could be a gesture of violence. No matter where you go in the world, all ancient cultures associated sticking your tongue out of your mouth as a way of conveying meaning, which could be either a good thing or a bad thing. There is no better evidence of how important tongues were to ancient people than in the artwork they left behind. The Aztecs, Mayans, Celts, Indians, and so many others left behind countless depictions of gods and men sticking out their tongues. In fact, many statues of their gods have their tongues sticking out, usually as a symbolism for bloodlust. But even though the tongue has been so important for so long, archaeologists and historians still don't quite understand why. What do you think the human fascination is with sticking out your tongue? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. We have lots of videos like these coming up. Mysterious Dwarf Houses For around 2,000 years through the Northwest Caucasus in Russia, thousands of ancient dolmens were built. These ancient stone buildings were called Ispun by the locals, which translates roughly to House of Dwarves. The Caucasus spans much of the land between the Black Sea and Mount Elbrus. And when I say dolmen, I mean an ancient megalithic structure made from stone blocks. A dolmen usually had a single chamber, one large stone as a ceiling, and a small access point. No matter where the dolmens were made, they were almost always the same. And this brings us to the coincidence. Throughout the wastelands of Russia, scientists have found no less than 3,000 dolmens. They were used explicitly for human burials. But scientists have also found dolmens in other parts of Europe, in Korea, and throughout mainland Asia.
The coincidence is that all these ancient cultures started building nearly identical stone dolmens or dwarf houses at the exact same time, and for the exact same reason, but we just don't know what it is. Twain and the Comet Samuel Longhorn Clemens, known to most people by his pen name Mark Twain, lived a very strange life of coincidences. He had what you might call a cosmic relationship with Halley's Comet, the most famous comet to ever grace our planet. The comet was first recorded in 239 AD, then officially named by astronomer Edmund Halley after learning of the same comet witnessed in 1531, 1607, and 1682. Before his death, he predicted the comet would return in 1758, and it did, and then it returned again in 1835, just as Mark Twain was being born. What makes this coincidence the strangest is that the famous author admitted his connection with the comet. He was utterly aware of it and was once quoted as saying, I came in with Halley's Comet and I expect to go out with it. And that's exactly what happened. When Mark Twain died of a heart attack on April 21, 1910, the comet just so happened to arrive back at Earth for the first time in 75 years, wrapping Mark Twain's life up in a neat little package of coincidence. Of course, there is no secret meaning or cosmic truth behind Mark Twain and Halley's Comet. It's just a curious element of fate. Pi and the Pyramid John Taylor was the first one to suggest that the builders of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the biggest pyramid in Giza, had incorporated the number of pi into its design. He said that if you divided the perimeter of the pyramid by its height, you could obtain a reasonable approximation of pi. Not the exact thing, but pretty close. This made him theorize that the ancient builders had intended the pyramid to be a representation of Earth. The perimeter was supposed to correspond to the circumference of the equator. His ideas were published in a book about the pyramid back in 1859. After that, more and more scientists got on board with the theory of pi. We now know that if you divide the perimeter of the Great Pyramid by its height, you get an approximation of pi within 0.04% accuracy. The same can be said when adding up the slope of each face of the pyramid. The level of accuracy here seems absolutely ridiculous, if of course the theories are correct. It would mean that the Egyptians had mastered the art of math, and why not? If they really had used this pyramid as an approximate representation of the planet, it would mean they had somehow measured the entire globe, and this does not seem like something they could have done. But maybe they had more knowledge of the stars and of math than we give them credit for. But the remaining question is this. Did the Egyptians really try to incorporate the mathematics of pi into the pyramid, or is it all just a surprising coincidence? Bucket and Cone What is the symbolic significance of the bucket and cone, depicted in art that is widespread throughout the ancient world? Archaeologists seem to have no idea. The bucket and cone are seen with deities represented in old Mesopotamian structures and in art from the more recent Neo-Assyrian Empire. There are dozens of reliefs showing a wide variety of deities holding what appears to be a pine cone in their right hand and a bucket or handbag in their left. Some have actually claimed these deities are the Anunnaki, a supposed race of ancient aliens that once enslaved humanity and forced our ancient ancestors to mine gold for them. But of course, there is no proof of this. A more logical explanation for the widespread bucket and cone symbolism is that they were both objects used in purification rituals going back over 5,000 years. The cone was dipped in a bucket of water and shook over a person to purify them. There is a lot of speculation that the bucket and cone are clues to a more complex human history, but the truth is probably quite simple. The reason these symbols are seen throughout so much of the old world is simply because the purification ritual was quite popular. As for the cone, well, it's been a symbol of fertilization for thousands of years. What do you think is the meaning behind the bucket and the cone? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye!